Task Force, which was formed in 2005, you know, as our, our original walls slumbered underground for many, many years, um, the task force was formed to research, identify, protect, and interpret Charleston's walled city. So in that guise, um, the committee consists of scholars, but also city employees, county employees, um, public education experts, you know, a range of people. And the idea was to get everybody talking. The coach, two co-chairs of the, of the um, committee are Peter McGee and Catherine Saunders Pemberton of the Historic Charleston Foundation. And Catherine in particular, you know, identified the fact that um, one kind of big issue we had is that city and county employees are working in the streets in places that we think the walled city is buried every day. You know, and they dig a hole to repair a pipe and they throw it back in and they may, you know, be on top of the city wall and not know what it is. So the goal was to really just start communication. And I can tell you we've been very successful in that regard. At the same time, we've had, you know, walk the wall tours, we've had lectures, and the real expert on the history of the walled city is Dr. Nick Butler at the, um, now he's public historian at the Charleston County Library. He gives fairly regular lectures on various aspects of the city wall. So if you want to know more, um, you know, look for Nick's lectures and be sure to go there. He's in the documents all the time. And just when I think I've got sort of a handle on what he's figured out, he finds new things. So that is always changing. Does Charleston have a city? I came, grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, mm -hmm. and we had another historic seaport and all that stuff. Right. Do you have, the city council has the right, when they dig and find something, to stop all digging, et cetera, et cetera, until we get an art, the art, city archaeology department comes in. And, mm -hmm. and is that what you're saying you do here? No. We do not have such an ordinance here in Charleston. There is no city protection for archaeological resources, including the city wall. There is no state level protection for archaeological resources, including the city wall. There's only federal protection. Now, we're very fortunate here in Charleston because we are collectively a preservation minded city, and the bar is very high in terms of you know, attention to detail. So, for example, with construction of the Judicial Center, the county was under no obligation to do any archaeology there at all, but they did it anyway. But do things fall through the cracks and get missed and get pushed around here by, you know, construction development all the time? I'm sorry. Charles. Yeah, it's, it's, it's too bad. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we, we're, you know, we need to all collectively, particularly as private citizens and maybe not scholars with perhaps a vested interest, remind city council and county council that protection would be a good idea. Yeah, and we've looked at that, Catherine, and various interns, you know, we've sent proposals to the city a lot. One of the sticking points is because the city is so rich, in order to enforce and, or to make an ordinance work, there would have to be a full-time archaeologist on staff. We do. Alexandria does. Yes, I know. But Charleston does not. Okay. So that's, right. where, that's where Charleston is. So, yeah. I'm call sorry, your city I'll council. No, that's a wonderful thing. I'm glad you brought it up. Call your city council representative. Do need that. So Charleston's walled city. Charleston is the only English walled city in North America. Um, Charleston was settled uh, in 1670 and then moved to the peninsula in 1680 in what was then called the very chap of the Spaniards. They, you know, we forget that in the mid to late 18th century when Charleston is flourishing and growing and you know it's all about making money. You know that really the early years of Charleston were very tenuous and the threat from the Spaniards was I think more perceived than actual but you know, there was a great deal of fear on both sides both here in Charleston and in Spanish St. Augustine fear of attack and there were a number of skirmishes back and forth so what we see happening and you know my research has taken me to St. Augustine in Spanish Florida as well as here is sort of this building escalation of fortifying both cities and actually very little ever happened that required them but you know you know best defense was a good offense i guess so that we all know the chris map and charleston appears by 1706 1711 as 
a fortified city. The, um, the, the, you all have a copy of the Grand Model, which shows Charleston laid out across the whole peninsula, but highlighted in red is the actual limits of the walled city. And those limits are roughly East Bay Street as the water's edge, where the um, wall was eventually bricked, um, Water Street, Meeting Street, and kind of, sort of, but not really Cumberland Street. Um, you know, with the powder magazine at its odd angle being set that way because of the angle of the walled city. And now, as you see from your 1739 map, it wasn't long before Charleston had expanded beyond those walls. But from about 1690 to 1730, Charleston was really defined physically and politically by those enclosing walls. Um, the earliest map that we have of fortifications or efforts to fortify Charleston is this relatively recently discovered Boyd map that um, Chippis Leland and Diane Ressinger published on about 10 years ago. And this shows the peninsula at an odd angle. And what it shows is um, basically a, a major fortification of what we think is the foot of Broad Street. Another roughly where Grenville Bastion would be uh, beneath historic Charleston Foundation, and a tranche or an entrenchment along what was East Bay Street. Uh, we think that this is probably earth and wood at this time. It's not until 1694 that there's an act for construction of a brick wall along Charleston's eastern edge. Um, it serves as a seawall, as you can see from the quote, to prevent the sea's further encroachment, but also for protection. And the, um, it's actually known as the wharf wall or the curtain line along the bay. Um, the first fortification completed, um, sort of, you know, following from the earthen fortifications that we see in the Boyd map is the Granville Bastion um, at the intersection of East Bay and East Battery, directly beneath historic Charleston Foundation, beneath the Misroom House. That's completed in 1696. The next portion completed of brick is the Half Moon Battery, which is beneath the Exchange Building. And these are both close-ups of the rendering from 1739. Um, now, there were skirmishes back and forth. Um, Charleston is the only English walled city in North America. The Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine is the only extant 17th century fortification um, in North America. And it is a national park. If you've never been there, it's a, a wonderful place to go. St. Augustine in general is a wonderful place to go. I would highly recommend it. Um, in 1702, um, South Carolina Governor James Moore leads a raid on St. Augustine and all of the inhabitants um, retreat to the Castillo. Um, Moore is not able to take the Castillo after an extended siege. He does um, eventually abandon the siege and returns to Charleston, burning a lot of St. Augustine on the way. Um, James Moore is just, I don't, I get a bad feeling about James Moore. <laughs> I don't like him at all. He was very blustery and very incompetent and, you know, very ruthless. And since he kind of messed this up, he followed it in 1704 with a raid on the Spanish missions of Appalachia, particularly um, in, Saint, in um, Tallahassee. And he burns and, and uh, destroys that mission and brings a lot of Native American slaves back to South Carolina. This is a whole other story, and I can't get <laughs> off on it. But we also think he brings a lot of Spanish cattle to um, breed with English cattle because they were a lot better. And that's the subject of a forthcoming publication, but like I say, that's, that's not on this tour. All right, in 1706, a combined Spanish and French force sails into the harbor from St. Augustine, and the impressive defensive works evidently dissuaded them from actually attacking the city. So it was expensive, but all of these fortifications worked on both sides. Um, what we understand from documents is the, east, the wall along East Bay, the sea wall was brick, but the landward walls, the other three, were earth. And, you know, built by basically digging a moat, taking that dirt, piling it up to create a palisade. Um, Nick Butler just gave a very interesting lecture about six months ago on the earthen walls and was really able to determine that what we've always heard is more or less correct, that they survived until the 1730s, and then... Um, as you see, just basically suggested in the 1739 map, they're, they're abandoned during, the, during that decade. Bulldozed down, things are built on top. But 
in those ensuing years, there's a lot of discussion that, you know, reinforces our idea that there are earth and there's legislation about keeping cattle from, from scrambling up and down the walls lest they break them down, keeping them from grazing on them, keeping people from climbing over the fortifications. Um, so in the Castillo remains an important landmark in St. Augustine. It appears that St. Augustine remains a little bit more fearful of um, being invaded throughout the 18th century, where after the 1730s and 40s, Charleston seems to really relax and not worry about that so much. I bring this just to show you how St. Augustine has reconstructed their city walls in Charleston. These are the city gates on their north side, but even the west side, the, the, the back side of the city there, they've reconstructed them very simply and inexpensively by piling dirt up in the shoulder of the road and planting yucca along it, which we think is um, how it would have looked. You know, it's not visually very obtrusive, but there it is for interpretation, and it certainly wasn't very expensive. So that's another wonderful idea I bring to my southern neighbors. Um, the seawall remains intact through the American Revolution, and after Charleston is incorporated in 1783, the new city sells off those fortifications. So these two plats of a wharf along East Bay shows the curtain line still extant in 1785 and then gone by 1787 when East Bay Street is widened. And to jump ahead a little bit, what we've learned is that the, the foundation of the curtain line and the, and the brick seawall is there. They simply seem to have pushed it over at street level and paved right over it. And one of the dynamics that's going on in the, seven, in the second half of the 18th century is that the curtain line really becomes an impediment to commerce. You know, the, the prospect of 1738, 1739 shows the water with no wharves, but that's not true. There's already eight big wharves there, and they continue to build more and more, and getting goods and people to the wharves becomes a real challenge. So the merchants and the politicians sort of, you know, it's an ongoing struggle through the 18th century. Do we maintain this protective feature, or do we um, go around it. So you see in this plat that it's been breached here for, for entry to this wharf, and then that eventually becomes a passageway once the wall is abandoned. And you know, in the few plats that we have, we see all of these little, little breaches cut into the wall, but it's still a hassle to get in and out of there. Martha? Yes. So that means that where the wharfs were, uh -huh. there's opening in the wall? Right, right. So there were a lot of wharfs. Yeah, not everybody had an opening. You know, some folks shared them, but you can see them along the way, and they were given permission to do that. Okay. So we'll see when we talk about our work at um, the Redana Track Street. That plat also has an opening that gets folks there. So I'll show you another one. But the way Purcell shows them, and you know how accurate Purcell is. I mean, this looks. This is not a smooth thing. It's basically just they hacked a hole through the parapet. Do we know how big or tall the wall was? Yeah, kind of, sort of. Um, the, the wall was built in the Vauban style of fortifications, which are sort of low and broad, so it's not tremendously high. What we think is there was about a four-foot parapet on top of the wall with cannon opening in. I think we'll, we'll get a picture of the, a close-up picture of, of the um, prospect, and you can see that, you know, a, it wouldn't be head high, you know, it would be sort of shoulder high. Okay, so when the city council was the demolition of the urban fortifications, what they were talking about was the seawall. Yes, mostly. The sea wall. Yeah, yeah, and the parapet that's on top of the foundation, the pieces that we retrieved from our dig were about three and a half feet high. So we think that they were narrow and then it stepped out, you know, so soldiers could walk along there and then probably you know, ground level was at some point below that. That's what we don't know exactly how, you know, where ground would be compared to the wider foundation. Wendy, this is an abstract question, sort of, but I remember seeing the um, forum in Rome and appreciating how high the land is today mm -hmm. versus where it was 2,000 years ago. I wonder how much land is on top of what was in the 1780s. It varies. You know, basically, Charles, you know, we today, except when it rains and two inches makes a difference, 
You know, Charleston is generally pretty flat. It had more relief. So, um, you know, on this side of East Bay Street, where it's Phil, you know, the marsh was six, seven feet below that and even farther early on. Um, in areas of Charleston that were high land, it's accumulated about two feet. So even on an individual site around town, you know, we can see tremendous difference. You know, people and activities build up. And, you know, I can, you know, as an archaeologist, I'm always thinking about that. How did this earth get here? I mean, I really do think about it all the time. And even my yard, I can see a difference in elevation, you know, in my flower beds and the sidewalk and everything in 30 years. You know, we really do make soil as we, you know, live and work in an area. And it just, it builds up. You know, and then something like, you know, the storm surge from Hurricane Hugo adds a layer. I think we all saw that. Um, and takes a layer. I mean, and can take a layer. Can yeah. you vote? It does vote. Yeah. Because I have friends who were, I was just telling Nora that in the front of that house, in order to put a pile, replace a piling, it was 85 feet down to the getting to dry sand. And then in the back of the house, which isn't necessarily that far away, it was only three feet. Yeah, we saw that in excavating in the rear of the Aiken Rec yard. The, um, the south side, we only, we hit sterile subsoil, the intercultural deposits in six inches. The north side, that had been part of the approach trench during the revolution, and prior to that, of course, you know, a creek bottom, you know, it sloped off that way. We went seven or eight feet. You know, that's just in that narrow backyard. So it, so it varies. We're always trying to figure that out. All right. So, you know, our question is, where was the walled city? Where is it? It seems like it would be very easy to take the Chris map and just lay it down on the city. The streets haven't moved and figure out exactly where the wall is. But none of that has worked. You know, the map's not that accurate. It, you know, we have copies of copies. It's actually an oblique view if you look at it carefully. So all of our attempts to do it by measuring, by drawing pen and ink, by using GIS, you know, you get one place to fit and it doesn't. So one, and the other part doesn't. Um, we also, I have to tout the 1721 Herbert map, which is a little bit different version of the walled city, and Catherine Pemberton feels is perhaps a more accurate version of how some of these features look. You can see there, for example, that the Granville Bastion um, down there on the southwest corner is a different configuration than the kind of real pointy Craven Bastion that's beneath um, the Customs House at the market. Um, and particularly the depiction of the drawbridge and moat at the, at the foot of Broad Street there ended up being, we think, the more accurate version. So when you're reading up on the walled city, don't forget this map. This is a good one to spend some time with. So what do we know about, you know, where have we found the wall? What do we know? The first peak at the wall was in the 1920s when architects um, Simmons and Lapham had a chance to look at the exposed uh, Granville Bastion, as in this room house, was being renovated for yet another time. I won't say the first and certainly not the last, but yet another time. So they were able to take these photographs and map the, the, um, the foundations before those additions were put on. And this is the profile of Granville Bastion. It was 14 feet tall from the top of the foundations that they encountered that you can see are at what would have been ground surface down um, a, a brick that battered toward this, to the water. And it sat on a cribbing of cypress planks followed by double layers of palmetto logs underneath horizontal palmetto logs to hold it up in the mud. And there you see the 1739 um, rendering of Granville Bastion. And you can see the features that I was talking about in terms of how high it is. Here are these little pieces of parapet. And we found some of those at um, Crad Street, and then these openings for the guns. And, but what we don't know is how far down beyond those gun placements ground would be. You can see that Granville was quite massive and much higher than even the seawall uh, or the curtain line along there. Uh, Granville Bastion is still beneath the Missouri House, perfectly preserved. Someday when we have tons of money, you know, and a brilliant, you know, architect, we would love to open up that basement a little bit so that you can see it. Right now, it's a really claustrophobic belly crawl from the basement of the foundation. 
along that dirt, but beneath the, the pipes to get to the front. You look, you see how dirty Catherine is there. That's how dirty you are when you go there, but it's wonderfully preserved there. The one place that you can see it and you can tell, um, you know, your guests on tour is the basement of the Exchange Building. The Half Moon Battery was excavated in 1965 by John Miller, who was associated with the Charleston Museum but not working with the museum. Mr. Miller did that excavation for Mr. Harrington Bissell and went down the face of the Half Moon Battery and, and recorded all the layers of soil and then passed away slowly after shortly after that and never kind of did anything with his artifacts. In 1771, the exchange building was built on top of the Half Moon Battery and on top of the filled land. So these are a couple of shots of Mr. Miller's excavations in the 60s in the basement and, um, and his two maps that shows that he encountered sort of this wonderful layer of piling, double pilings in front of the Half Moon Battery. He thought that they were perhaps a coffer dam for repairing the half moon after the 1752 hurricane, but they're actually very nicely finished, and we think that they are actually probably there originally as a breakwater. We found the same thing at the Redan. Um, it's all still under the basement. We had a chance a few years ago to go back in the back room and kind of clear out some debris. Here's another claustrophobic place to dig, but see it's all there. We're over there in the um, southwest corner. And there we were again able to see the curtain line and the interface of the Half Moon Battery. A couple other places that we've looked for the wall. Um, archaeologists of New South Associates in the 90s did a great deal of work in advance of construction of the Judicial Center and found just wonderful evidence of the early 18th century. They were looking for evidence of the drawbridge and the moat. They did find the moat, but for just a few minutes in a backhoe cut. It was very deep, very wet, the soils were unstable, and there wasn't much in it. It was just, they had pushed the dirt back in and it was churned up sterile soil, a little layer of humus, and they were able to, they weren't even able to get a photograph of it. It was open for just a moment. But the next day, that backhoe cut came across a line of four cedar pilings, two of which you see here, that were retrieved and conserved. One's on exhibit at the Judicial Center in their lobby, and the other one is at the Charleston Museum on exhibit. Um, we've looked several times for the Carteret Bastion at the northwest corner of town. We have not been successful in finding it. Uh, uh, there's been little archaeological dig. It's supposed to be more or less at, at Cumberland and Meany Streets. We look for it here on the Lane Herald. Look for it on this property. We of course kept an eye out for this line along here when we worked at the Powder Magazine, but to no avail. Um, here's where legislation would have been great. There's two parking garages here. One built in the 70s. One built more recently. No archaeology done there. We didn't get a chance to even go look and see if we could see it in those lines. That would have been nice. Um, the biggest dig was done at the South Trust Bank building when they renovated the building about a decade ago. They also didn't have to do any archaeology, but they agreed to a couple of days and some funds for New South Associates to look there. In a big open area, they did find a linear dirt feature. That's going to be the challenge of these landward walls. They're dirt, you know, and they basically are going to be a big filled-in ditch. You know, there's not a whole lot of big open space in the city anywhere where that footprint would be. And, you know, it's going to take a big open area to be sure that we've got it. So they had a maybe there, but not a, a certainty. So that's, that's why we really know very little about the, the landward walls and exactly where they're located. Um, our most successful project has been the excavation that probably many of y'all saw. How many visited the Redan dig in 2008-2009? This was a wonderful chance to look for this thing. First of all, we had this wonderful Purcell flat. See, there's a little breach in the curtain line up at the top of that flat where you see they could come through there to access those wharves and to access the market. And the Redan is a, a triangular projection that was used for crossfire. That was the purpose of it. And this plaque shows it being right in the middle of South Edgers Wharf at the foot of Trad Street. In this 1785 plaque, they've already demolished the Redan, 
but the curtain line is still intact. And the city had those cobblestones up for the drainage project, and Catherine and Peter persuaded Mayor Riley to give us two weeks to look for the redam before they put the cobblestones back and the funds to do it. So we started out in 2008, just going to do a big, quick backhoe look to see if we could find the wall and find out where it was. And we have the 1785 plat that y'all see and the 1793 plat when the Redan is gone and they constructed 90 East Bay Street and expanded the lower market. The, but the market's another whole story too. Um, so we started digging. Um, the day before Eric Poplin, an archaeologist with Brockington, who's done a lot of work in Charleston, said, well, you know, you know, we've been monitoring this drainage project all over the city and most of this big street were mucked out in the 19th century and filled with clean sand. I said, we've gotten this money and this permission and all this equipment, and it might not even be here. <laughs> oh, I started getting a big stomach ache. <laughs> but our first cut showed us that the stratigraphy is intact. You see all those layers there. And I know you all know enough about archaeology to know that that's what we look for. So we knew the site was intact, but our cut all the way across that we thought would have hit both sides of that redan didn't hit anything. So that gave me another stomach ache. <laughs> but, but Eric is really a great field archaeologist and a great thinker. And he just, he said, well, we need to dig another trench. We need to go east-west. What does he say? You've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. <laughs> so we dug east-west and we started to hit brick. You see me frantically sweeping there because we have the right color brick. That early brick from the city wall is very bright red-orange. The mortar's very white. It's not the Charlton gray bricks at all. And so that looked good, but it was at a very funny angle. So we worked and worked, and to make a long story short, we did, in fact, find the north face of the Redan. The reason we didn't find it right away in that trench cut is these are those weird bricks, and that's not the wall. That's that parapet that's been pushed forward in big chunks. You see two chunks of it there. Um, this is the actual wall. This is an 1850s drain that cut right through it. And that's what we were on top of, of all the stinking luck. But we eventually figured it out. And here, this is the reason for the Wall City Task Force. This water pipe was put in only six years ago by the same crew that was helping us work here. You know, so they had chopped a little divot all the way through this five foot wide bright orange brick wall, but at that time they didn't know what they were looking for. So now they know, and now they call us all the time. So that was a great success. So here's where we thought the wall would be, where we thought we would hit it. This is what we found. It was at a little different angle than we expected, so we only got the north face. But as we were filling that in, we were already looking to this parking lot here and where the point might be, and the parking lot is owned by the city. So we all went back to Mayor Riley and, and got a 10-minute meeting with him and asked for an, a chance to work there, this time with College of Charleston students coming up for their field course the next year, and also a little bit more money. And he just said, well, we have to do it. And that's how that happened. So we came back. We took off literally where we, where we stopped. Here's where we dug in 2008. Here's our parking lot where we took one, two, three parking spaces. And we began to excavate, and this time we excavated more slowly. We excavated by hand in our five-foot squares. We knew what we were looking for. We knew where we might find it. The first thing we found in all of our units, two things. One is this big, massive foundation, which is the foundation for the twin to the other Van Drops tenement, which is five feet deep and about this wide. So we knew that wasn't going to be too good for archaeology. The other thing we found all over, this is the paving for the lower market put, put down in 1789 to clean that up. We had hit it the year before. So that's a wonderful sort of little horizon there. They're very distinctive little pavers. They're smaller and thinner than regular bricks. Um, the other thing, you see this little crack right along there, a little fault in it? Well, we kept working, and in fact, the reason for that is that's the edge of the redan. And you see Luke giving us a big thumbs up when we went below the brick wall. And sure enough, there was, there's the point of the redan, and there's the face of it right there beneath that paving. So 
So this is our first chance in, in almost 100 years, our second chance to take a look at the base of the Redan. In 2008, we didn't dig below the water table because you often find wonderfully preserved artifacts below the water table, wood, leather, that kind of stuff. And we didn't have the money to conserve it because once it comes out of the ground, it starts to decay right away. As horrible as it sounds, the best thing we could do is not find it, not go get it. The best place for it is right there in the ground where we can come back. In 2009, we really wanted to see what the foundation looked like, so we decided to go on into that soil. And we actually didn't find our organic artifacts in it at all, only a few. What we found here is that instead of sitting on the horizontal palmetto logs like Granville Bastion, it's on sort of a network of two-foot cypress pilings. And we retrieved one of those. That's on display at the museum. And you can see sort of the nest of them there beneath it. Um, the city's wonderful vacuum truck that makes a racket that you probably don't like outside your house. I love that thing. <laughs> and the operator, Mr. Um, James Bonnet, known as Tiny, just, you know, pulled a lot of extra soil, washed the wall off, really helped us get our work done. So here's our foundation. There's the Granville. There's all of our wonderful soil layers. And here's how deep, you know, the soil is east of East Bay. Here's that 1789 market paving that we started with. All of this is fill from the lower market. And then here's our plump mud. This would have been original grade prior to construction in 1750. And here's that same little line of breakwater pilings like um, Mr. Miller saw in the in the um, basement of the Exchange Building. And we retrieved a couple of those for conservation. They were conserved at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab. And those are also on the exhibit now. Lots of artifacts in the market. The lowest level, the plump mud, was full of um, ballast stones that you see there, full of lots and lots of wine bottles. <laughs> uh, just tons of them. The tray that you see up there, you see a few little ceramics in one corner some pipes, and all the rest of it was bottle glass, bottle glass, bottle glass. Um, here's a range of the 18th century artifacts that we got from the fill. Um, you know, just a kind of an exciting cross-section of, of materials from 18th century Charleston. And then here's, I'm sorry for that gentleman's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was, that's one thing I tell students, be sure you don't wear any t-shirts or things that you don't want your mama seeing <laughs> in a lecture 20 years from now, but it was a hot day. So anyhow, that's the only photo I have that puts those two pieces together, so we have to see his britches there. <laughs> um, and then this is our composite of the Redan as we found it. We did rebury it, but um, we got a grant from the Southeastern Archaeological Conference in 2012 to fund the on-site um, interpretation. If you haven't been by there lately, there are two signs and a portion of the parapet, one of those pieces that we retrieved from the dig. And um, part of the proposal here was to outline the footprint of the Redan in the current ground surface. And we had proposed sort of that, that plastic, uh, plastic brick looking stuff that crosswalks are made out of. And we had a budget of $500. And when it finally went to city design, they said, well, we don't like that. We think it needs to be real brick. We said, well, we have $500. And they said, well, we'll do it anyway. So I don't know how much that cost. It was more than $500. But here it is. It took a while for it to happen, but that is also in place now. You know, it goes right through the, the cobblestone and the paving and, you know, I think is subtle but effective. So. Um, that's Doug Scott, a master mason here who advised us in the field and then came and got our section ready for exhibit. Just a few more peeks that we've had since then. Um, the section of the wall that runs from Granville Bastion um, over to the Ashley Bastion before running along Water Street. We know is intact beneath the street. Here we see remote sensing going on in um, East Bay Street and in 43 East Bay. That's recently been renovated, and sure enough, there's the wall running through their driveway, and the owners there gave us permission to, to excavate there and to map it, and then they very subtly marked that footprint in their driveway, not in brick, but in slate. If you peek through the gate, you'll see 
you know, that odd angle running through the yard. Very nice restoration. And finally, we had the fortifications, but we've never really gotten the curtain line on the footprint. And so as part of all that water work at, at that same corner, we, um, the city persuaded Anson Construction and Charleston Water Systems came out and gave us a day because Catherine thinks, thought that the curtain line runs up to parallel parking places. So they brought out their equipment and they gave us a day and we looked in, looked in the parallel parking places and we didn't find anything. So they just trotted over and pulled up that section of sidewalk and we didn't find it. And we finally located it in the shoulder in the grassy strip. And once again, you can see there's a 20th century pipe, there's a 19th century foundation, but squished between it is that bright red brick and bright white mortar of the um, curtain line. So that was, that was a wonderful January day. So we continue to work, we continue to look, um, any chance we have to kind of improve this footprint. And that's what we know today. Maybe next year we'll know something else. So much. You're welcome. Um, I happened to be there the day they found it, so I was I was just moved to Charleston. Oh, that was fun. I was here about three months, and I was there the day they found it. It was oh, really exciting for me. Um, again, just.